Okay, everyone, this will pretty much bring the uh, mini lectures and, and really our course to a close here. This will be the last thing we talk about in History 1305. Um, and so now we're dealing with the issue of Reconstruction. The Confederates had surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse. The war has come to a close, and, and now the country is sort of left with this issue of how do we put the pieces back together? This was a brutal, drawn-out war, and over 650,000 Americans had died in the Civil War on both sides. Um, and so obviously there's a lot of bad blood. Um, and there's going to be some political schisms going on here as well. Um, and the key ones that you need to be aware of before we get into all of this, just to get the background, um, is that in the North you have uh, now, you still only have union states that are politically active in the Northern legislature, in the federal legislature, I should say. Um, and you have what are known as moderate Republicans, people like Lincoln, um, who are looking to drive forward the, uh, their plans for uh, Reconstruction. And generally, the moderate Republicans are thinking, we want to quickly put this country get back together. We want to get over this horror of the Civil War and just move on with our lives. Let's just put it behind us and get on with it. Then you also have what are known as radical Republicans. Radical Republicans are people who want to rebuild the country and put it back together, but they also want to punish the South. These people are angry. The North is angry. No one in the North was untouched by this war. Everybody lost someone, a brother, an uncle, a cousin. Somebody had died in the course of this war, and they are really upset. They want vengeance. And so the radical Republicans have a few key goals. They want to uh, control Reconstruction. Uh, they want to punish any former Confederates. They want to ensure the rights of freedmen or African Americans who are going to be emancipated from slavery. Uh, and then ultimately, they are going to also uh, want to ensure that Southern Democrats, the other political party that's still floating around out there, they want to make sure Southern Democrats never regain political office. They have a few different reasons for this. One, that's their political rival, the Democratic Party. But two, uh, there's also the issue of if Southern Democrats come back into power, then the old South is going to come back. The slaveocracy, the racism, all of the things that we think of in the slavery era are going to be ushered back in with the Southern Democrats. And to kind of spoil the surprise for you, that's exactly what's going to happen. The Southern Democrats are going to come back into power in the Southern states, and they're eventually uh, going to take over uh, a, a, one of the houses of Congress uh, by the time that we get to the end of Reconstruction. Uh, and so they will be, that's how the Democratic Party is going to survive, is they're going to be ushered back in uh, by rejecting the overtures of Republican politicians during Reconstruction. And again, as I said, the big picture what you need to take away from all of this is this is why racial problems in America weren't solved after the Civil War. This is why they are going to linger into the 20th century, and there's the need for a civil rights movement. There's the need to continue ad to address these problems of racial inequality. And it's because of the policies that Southern Democrats enacted during Reconstruction, because Republicans didn't successfully see this plan through and protect the rights of freedmen. So, as I mentioned, I'm going to leave you to read the chapter on Reconstruction. It's going to deal with the whole comprehensive picture of it. Uh, anybody who goes on and takes History 1306 will probably start with Reconstruction as well. So all I'm trying to do in this brief video is hit the high points that are most likely to appear on your exam, the ones I really want to drive home. And so we need to start with the Reconstruction Amendments uh, because actually the 13th Amendment, uh, the first of the Reconstruction Amendments, actually happens in the midst of the Civil War, right during the middle of Sherman's March to the Sea. Um, in late 1864 and early 1865, Lincoln and the moderate Republicans were able to work together with radical Republicans to pass the 13th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. Um, now, this, as I mentioned, is the first of the Reconstruction Amendments. Uh, and the Reconstruction Amendments are the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitutions, the Constitution of the United States collectively. When you put those three amendments together, we label those the Reconstruction Amendments. It is critically important that you keep these Reconstruction Amendments separate in your head from what are known as the Reconstruction Acts. 
They are completely unrelated, and they do not. Uh, you, if you answer uh, affirmatively with one instead of the other on the exam, you're going to miss points. Um, so, what we're seeing here with the Thirteenth Amendment is that. This is the only Reconstruction Amendment to be passed before Lincoln's assassination, and this is his baby. If you had the patience to sit through that three-hour movie, Lincoln, this is pretty much what it was all about, his push to get the 13th Amendment passed. The problem here is that Lincoln went ahead, and remember, Lincoln's a lawyer. He understands the law. In the midst of the war, he went ahead and did something that was completely illegal. Um, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, in which he said the slaves living in Confederate territory will now, now and forever be free. He can't actually do that. Um, and so here is the problem. He has done something that he's illegal, but he's promised these people their freedom. They've left the plantation. It's over. They're out of slavery. But how does he ensure that they're not taken back into slavery? He has to get this amendment passed. And so when he's successful at doing this, this is the crowning achievement of Lincoln's presidency. The 13th Amendment outlaws slavery and involuntary servitude in the United States. This is why we cannot legally allow slavery in this country anymore. Uh, but there is a caveat. And this caveat is important because it's going to be exploited by the Southern Democrats who are coming back into power during Reconstruction in the later phase. It says, slavery and involuntary servitude is illegal and outlawed in the U.S., except if you've been convicted of a crime. If you've been convicted of a crime, you can be put back onto a plantation. And so the South is eventually going to come and exploit this. They're going to start arbitrarily arresting African Americans and going, well, we've convicted you with an all-white jury, a biased jury, and now we're able to throw you back into slavery. Um, and so that's what the 13th Amendment is all about. And again, what you're going to see, there's a pattern here. Republicans in the North will pass these laws intended to protect African Americans, and the South is going to find loopholes, and they're going to exploit those loopholes to deny African Americans their constitutional rights. And this is the first example we're seeing of that. Now, we're going to be going through all of the Reconstruction Amendments, but there's another important body being established on the ground in the South. You have these politicians in the North are sitting up there making legislation. They're going, we passed this law and we passed that law. Laws don't mean anything if they can't be enforced. Um, and they also don't mean anything if you don't have a mechanism to enact them. Um, and so, the law and order aspect of what's going on in the South is as the war comes to an end, the Union Army is put in charge of the South. They are going to basically, the whole South is under martial law. There is no civil government in the South because they all broke away and joined the Confederacy. They're all treasonous. They're all seditious. And so there are no politicians. There's no leadership left in the South. Um, so the Union Army is in control, but the Freedmen's Bureau would be established in March of 1865, and it's being passed when you have mostly Republicans in charge of Congress. The agency would become the foundation of Reconstruction plans on the ground in the South. Um, it would be performing a lot of very practical and critical tasks in the war-ravaged South. First, the Bureau is going to become a safety net to help economically suffering African Americans. You have now given them freedom because the 13th Amendment's been passed. But as a result, you've also severed their ties to their only homes that they've ever known. You have a massive homelessness problem after the war amongst African Americans because their homes were the plantations and they can no longer go to the plantations. Um, and so... Ultimately, African-American families are struggling. They need a place to stay. The Freedmen's Bureau is essentially going to be setting up refugee camps for them as it sort of as practically acted out on the ground. They're delivering food. They're delivering medicine. That's a, a really critical part of what the Freedmen's Bureau does. Uh, now, the Bureau is also going to be instrumental in building schools for African-American children in the South. Many of these kids are going to become the first kids in their family who ever gain literacy. Um, in addition to that, a lot of the uh, historically black colleges and universities that you see around today would be established under the auspices of the Freedmen's Bureaus. So the HCBUs get their starts with funding from the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, the Bureau is also going to be put in charge of managing federally confiscated lands. 
This might not seem like a big deal to you, but it is. Uh, all of the lands that were taken away by Sherman during his march to the sea are going, all the lands that the Confederates lost during the Civil War, they're now under the control of the Freedmen's Bureaus. And the Freedmen's Bureau is going to be using it to help African Americans who are struggling on the ground. Um, in, F in essence, the, the Bureau really becomes the first effort by the United States government to establish social welfare uh, sort of structures uh, and, and really help people on the ground. They're helping to, to sort of fix these problems with disenfranchised African Americans. Um, and so it's a critically important unit of reconstruction. Now, I know I'm jumping around and kind of moving fast here, but most of you probably know Lincoln doesn't live too long in, uh, to see Reconstruction play out. Uh, it it kind of gives rise to the old joke, uh, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? Uh, but Lincoln, for, if you don't know, was uh, assassinated by a Confederate sympathizer by the name of John Wilkes Booth in Ford's Theater in 1865. Um, now, he had picked a vice president in Andrew Johnson uh, as part of what they call a national unity ticket. In other words... What he was trying to do is say, I'm a Republican, I'm from Illinois in the North, I need somebody who's going to make us look like we're a unified front. I need someone who's different from me as my vice president. And he picks Andrew Johnson. Johnson was brought up in slaveholding North Carolina. Uh, he was a Southern Democrat, but he remained uh, really loyal to the Union throughout the war as a representative from the state of Tennessee. So when Lincoln goes up for his second election and his second term, he picks Johnson as a vice president. Now, Johnson will be remembered for what is known as presidential reconstruction, and he's also remembered as the veto president. Um, so he would constantly be in conflict with the Republicans who are controlling Congress at this point. Uh, it looks at first like he might actually kind of carry on the responsible plan of reconstruction that Lincoln had laid out. Uh, but when he gets into office, he immediately flips a switch and he becomes very much the slave holding sympathizer, the uh, Confederate sympathizer that you would think he would be. Um, and he's going to constantly be vetoing any legislation that uh, Republicans are putting on his desk to try to help African Americans in the Reconstruction process. So moving on through our, our slideshow, our PowerPoint presentation, we're looking at Johnson's approach to Reconstruction. The radical Republicans are saying, we want the South punished, and we want the people involved in the Confederacy punished before any of the, we can even start talking about bringing these southern states back in. Moderate Republicans are saying, we just need to find a responsible way to make sure that southern Democrats and the people who led this Confederacy don't come back into power. Johnson gets into the presidency and he says, I want you all to just reform your governments however you want, elect whoever you want. I don't care if they were a con uh, part of the Confederate government or not. Just elect them, reform your governments, and reapply for statehood. It's an incredibly haphazard plan. Um, so he was incredibly lenient on any former Confederates. He's not asking. He doesn't make them get pardons. He doesn't ask for oaths of loyalty like other people are doing. Um, and he constantly is trying to undercut the efforts of radical Republicans who are looking out for the safety and well-being and the rights of the freedmen in the South, the freed African Americans. Under Johnson's presidency, you will see a number of Southern states elect numerous former Confederates to public office. And they're going to start, these states start to enact what are known as black codes. They start to become established all throughout the South. Out of everything I'm talking about in Reconstruction, there are some critical points, and the Black Codes are one of those critical points. What the Black Codes are are mechanisms used in the South to fight Reconstruction plans, to fight rights being given to African Americans. What they're all about is they're saying, oh, the North is giving you all these rights. Well, we're going to enact a black code. And if you were to pick one of these up and read them, on the surface, it looks like it's well -being, it, for the well-being of African Americans. They'll say things like, we don't want violence to erupt amongst African Americans. We'd hate for, for people to get shot or killed. So African Americans aren't allowed to have guns. Violation of their Second Amendment rights. Um, now, they're going to say things like, we would hate for African Americans to get into courts of law and incriminate themselves unfairly because they don't understand the legal system. 
So we're not going to let them testify. We're not going to let them be witnesses. We're not going to let them bring lawsuits in courts of law, denying them their citizenship rights. Uh, they're going to say they're going to start imposing things like literacy tests and poll taxes to make sure that African Americans can't vote. They're going to start to pass anti miscegenation laws under these black codes, saying that uh, blacks and whites can't get married to one another. Uh, they're going to say. We don't want, uh, we want to make sure that African Americans have a space to live within our southern cities. So we're going to give them this part of the city over here. That's something we call segregation. Um, and so what you're seeing is that these black codes, they look well-meaning. Uh, if you don't know what you're looking at and you were just to pick it up and read it, you would think it was for the protection of African Americans. It is not. These codes are used to deny African Americans the rights that are being granted to them by Republicans in the North. This is the mechanism through which uh, Southern Democrats are going to rebuild the Old South, the antebellum South, the South of slavery, the slaveocracy, and the plantation culture. Um, so, Ultimately, uh, Johnson is going to be the one who oversees all of this, but there would be a number of executive and legislative battles. The Republicans in Congress hate Johnson. Uh, they're always fighting with him over reconstruction plans. They're saying exactly what I just said. If we allow Johnson's plan to take hold, the Old South's going to come right back in. So when Congress reconvenes in 1866, Republicans refused to recognize any of the representatives who were elected under Johnson's presidential reconstruction plan. Uh, they're going to say, basically, if you want to rejoin the union, you come through Congress. You don't go to the president. President Johnson doesn't say how you get admission to the union. We do. Um, and so, despite the fact that Johnson kept trying to veto every act that came across his desk from Congress, Congress would be successful in expanding and extending the scope of the Freedmen's Bureau, and they would be successful at passing America's first Civil Rights Act in 1866, saying that you cannot discriminate against somebody based on their race. Um, so Republicans are, are basically going to continue to watch Johnson try to veto this legislation, and they're concerned. They've passed the Civil Rights Act saying that African Americans have rights just like a normal American white American citizen. Uh, they have the same rights, same everything. And then they look at this and they say, here's the problem. If Southern Democrats ever do get back into power, an act can be balled up and thrown in the trash. Because of that, they make it their top priority in 1866 to pass the 14th Amendment. They want to make sure that, that if ever Southern Democrats came back into power, that they could not get rid of this amendment. Amendments can't be balled up and thrown in the trash. Acts can. And so the 14th Amendment redefined the role that the federal government played in protecting individual citizenship rights. The 14th Amendment states that all former slaves would be granted immediate citizenship in the United States that all citizens were entitled to equal protection under the law, uh, that states that refused to, may, uh, to give citizens, including African-American men, the right to vote, they would lose their congressional representation. In other words, if Alabama wants to deny African-Americans the right to vote, then the United States government will take away representation from Alabama. They don't get votes in Congress anymore. Um, so, all former Confederates would need to sign a specific congressional pardon to hold office under the 14th Amendment, um, and former slave owners could not be compensated by the state or federal government for their losses uh, that happened during the war. In other words, we're not going to pay you for the slaves that were taken away from you when they were freed. That's what the, re uh, the 14th Amendment is all about. So just to recap, to get the big picture here, the 13th Amendment makes slavery and indentured servitude illegal. The 14th Amendment is going to grant African Americans their citizenship rights. So it's important that you keep those things straight. Now, I'm going to make things a little difficult for you. I'm going to come in and talk about these Reconstruction Acts. These are totally unrelated to the Reconstruction Amendments. Uh, but what the Reconstruction Acts are all about is they're a way for radical Republicans to undo what Johnson had done. It's a way for Congress to take control of Reconstruction again and get it away from Andrew Johnson. 
And in 1867, they're going to pass four Reconstruction Acts. The first one had de- uh, basically divided the South into five military districts, and it put them all under martial law. They're all under the rule of the Union Army um, until they could uh, ultimately regain peace in these territories. Once peace was established, Congress overhauled the process for re uh, re uh, applying for uh, stateship in the union. Basically, what they're saying is that um, all of the previous policies that Johnson put in place for coming back into the United States, they're gone. Um, And then new states would need to uh, include a provision guaranteeing universal male suffrage, meaning that all the states that come back in have to promise they're going to let African-American males vote. So, Once Congress had approved a state's constitution and that state had accepted the 14th Amendment that had just recently been passed, they could then be reconsidered for admission in the Union. So that's what the Reconstruction Acts are all about. Remember, you got to keep them separate from the amendments. Um, So another kind of key idea, there's, there's some key terms you need to understand about rebuilding the Republican Party in the South, or building it in the first place, really. Uh, Republicans were never in the South, because the South was pro-slavery and Republicans were abolitionists. So there's going to be some key groups of people uh, that are going to have to go there in order to build a Republican Party base in the South. The first you have are known as carpetbaggers. These are northern businessmen and politicians who relocated from the north and moved into the south after the war, and they would be voting for the Republican Party. They're called carpetbaggers because they're carrying suitcase that looks like bags made out of carpet. You also have scalawags. These are few and far between. What scalawags are is they are white southerners who are against slavery. There's not a lot of them, but they did exist. And so they would be out there um, basically voting Republican because they believed in the anti-slavery message. And the final group that you have included in here um, are the freedmen. The freedmen are naturally going to be voting Republican because the Republican Party is the one that emancipated them from slavery. They don't vote for Southern Democrats. The Southern Democrats want to oppress and hold them down. And so all of those groups are the uh, the formation of a Republican Party in the American South after the war. And if you're following with me on the next slide, you're seeing the Southern reactions to Republicans in the South. Now, many of you probably don't know this, but the Ku Klux Klan, uh, it was formed in Pulaski, Tennessee in uh, 1867, made up of former Confederates. The Ku Klux Klan has undergone a number of changes over the years. They actually have different manifestations. If if I'm not mistaken, the Klan that exists in modern-day America is the third manifestation of the Ku Klux Klan. The first manifestation comes during the Reconstruction period. They're there to terrorize African Americans. They are there to create problems for African American families, to to threaten them, to try and stop them from voting. But really, there is a political aim to the first Ku Klux Klan that later manifestations of it don't have. Um, They are looking to suppress Republican votes. A scalawag is as much at risk from the Ku Klux Klan as is a freedman because they both vote Republican. Really, the Klan becomes a mouthpiece of the Democratic Party in the South. It's actually an armed wing of the Democratic Party in a lot of ways. Um, And so the Ku Klux Klan is going to rise up during this period, as does uh, organizations like the White League. They're there to try to terrorize African Americans, but also to suppress Uh, Southerners and people living in the South from voting Republican. That's really what they're all about. So again, I'm moving quickly, but I do want to wrap this up for you all and just touch on these key ideas. Um, Now, the final Reconstruction Amendment is the 15th Amendment. This occurs shortly after Ulysses S. Grant, the former general, has been elected as president. Uh, He's a Republican candidate. He's elected to president. And the Republicans set about tightening the language surrounding universal male suffrage in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, The 14th Amendment implied that African-American males would get the right to vote uh, because they're getting all of the citizenship rights. And voting is a citizenship right. But the South 
they fought back against that. They said voting's not a right, it's a privilege. Not everybody gets the right. Women don't get the right to vote. People under the age of 21 don't get the right to vote. So they started denying African Americans this right. This is what makes the 15th Amendment necessary. The 15th Amendment ultimately guaranteed that a person's race or previous condition of servitude, which is what the South was using to bar them from voting, could not stop them from voting or the rights naturally enjoyed by citizens of the U.S. So to recap, the 13th Amendment ends slavery in the United States. The 14th Amendment guarantees African Americans citizenship rights. And the 15th Amendment of 1870 guarantees voting rights for African Americans. So, We've hit most of the high points here, but the last thing I want to talk about um, is the end of Reconstruction. Uh, by 1876, the Black Codes have been effective. Johnson's haphazard plans for Reconstruction have been somewhat effective before uh, the Republicans could stop it. And Southern Democrats have been swept back into state office all over the South, uh, and they had also taken control of Congress at this point in time. So the old conservative white planner class had come back in to dominate all of the state governments in the South, and they now had a voice on a national level. They could now enact federal policies again. The Republicans now have a, a, an opponent in national politics. Additionally, you had the rise of the Redeemers and the Mississippi Plan, which are covered in your textbook. They are spreading fear and terror all over the South. But all of this going on, you now have the return of the old slaveocracy. But the South had also met conditions by 1877, the end date for our course, to where Grant starts pulling the Union troops out of the South and there is a return to civil government. And so that's what brings Reconstruction to an end. When we come out of it, you're going to see that life for African Americans did not get sizably better in the South. Because the Southern Democrats had swept back into office, because the South had been successful at finding caveats and loopholes in federal legislation that had been passed by Republicans, the problems for African Americans are going to continue in the U.S. South. Well, that is where I'm going to wrap things up. This segues you nicely into History 1306 if you're going on to take it. If you have any questions about any of this material, be sure to email me. It is going to show up on the final exam. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed the class. I hope you're all staying safe, staying well out there. This is the last time I get to address you through a video. So uh, best of luck to you all in your future uh, careers, your educational endeavors. Um, and don't be a stranger. If you ever have any questions about history, not just U.S., but world or African history, which you probably have forgotten by now is actually what I do, uh, you know, feel free to drop me an email, pop by my office. I'm always open to old students. Um, so I'll still be communicating with you through Blackboard. Um, I'll still be putting up the study guide for our final exam. I'll still be answering any questions you might have. And don't forget about the signature assignment that will be due on April 26th. I'll be talking to you about that in the following week as well. I hope you all take care and I wish you the best of luck.